Good morning. morning. Let's, Let's pray again. Lord, we do confess our need of you this morning. All of us, we need you. You are life. You are truth. You're the way. And we're not. So Lord, we come and ask that you would continue to speak to us. Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding today to the things of God. Ask you to take away any blinders there may be on our eyes that would hinder us from seeing you, from understanding your ways. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would be glorified here through this message and through the fruits of it as we serve you and live that our light would so shine that men would glorify you, our Father in heaven. So bless each one who's here today with your heavenly touch, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning. I want to talk to you today about the prescription that nobody wants to take. When I was a a boy, I think I was maybe, um, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna say seven or eight. Uh, We had a situation in our family. My sister had worms. And because she had worms, the doctor wanted everybody to take this medicine to to get rid of worms. And so I was, uh, I had to take this medicine. And, I just couldn't do it. This stuff tasted so bad. It was like pink, pinkish red liquid. Anybody ever drink that stuff for worms? And every time I take a little sip of it, I just gag. And you know, feel like I was gonna throw up and and my personality is kind of that way anyway. I, I, you know, I'm a little, uh, (laughs) sometimes I have trouble with stuff like that. So anyway, my mother tried everything she could do to get me to drink that stuff. She, in her parenting uh, bag of tricks, she would beg me. She'd plead with me. She would threaten me. She would offer me, you know, uh, rewards. Ice cream and this and that. Just, you know, just take it. She was, you know, she was at her wit's end. How do I get this little guy to take this stuff? And I just, I hated it. And, and, uh. It was a very stressful time, really, for all of us. <laughs> right, for my mother, wor- the worst. But um, to me, that medicine was worse than whatever good that may have supposedly come out of it. And finally, my mother threw her hands up and she gave up. And her final uh, salvo was, you know, okay, that's it. You know, if, if you have worms the rest of your life, you know, that's on you. I tried. And uh, at that point, I didn't care. Because that medicine was so disgusting. I, I'm thankful I cannot remember what the taste was like. Um, you know, I guess God in his mercy, he erases some things from our, our memory. But it was really foul. And... Uh, It was a prescription that I didn't want to take. I didn't really know if I had worms anyway, and whatever this stuff was was so bad that I just, I'm not taking it. And you know, there's a lot of uh, medicines and and things like that that are pretty pretty tough, pretty rough, especially for serious uh, diseases and things. Sometimes the the cure, the the remedy, is actually something that almost feels worse than, than whatever you have. And uh, in spiritual things, it's the same. We have a serious disease or problem or sickness. 
Uh, and it's not COVID-19. That, that's serious too, but this is way more serious. This, this one has a 100% death rate. And what I'm, what I'm referring to here, I could say sin, but what I'm referring to is what I would say is more the, um, the root or the, the thing that gives sin a place to operate, and that is self. And when I say self, what I mean is the fleshly, carnal, natural, Adam life that's in everybody. That is the cause of so much of the, maybe all of the issues on this earth, if you think about it. Where do wars come from? They come from selfish people feeling like there's something that's worth fighting over that you have or I have or, or whatever. It's the source of all interpersonal conflict. Self. It's the problems in all institutions, government, church, family. If there's church problems, I guarantee you there's a self problem. The problems in government, they're there because of self. The problems in the family, you trace them right back to self. The breakdown of the families in our nation, which leads to more problems of crime, drug addiction, and all these things, you can trace them all back to self. It's man living himself as he chooses to live instead of as we were created to live, which was as vessels for God to live through. So there's only two options in, in life. It's either we are our own self in the, the driver's seat and the control, or else God is sitting on the throne of our heart running our life. You think about the problem, you know, some of the, all the um, riots and things we've had recently uh, about the, the violence in the streets and all these social issues. You could trace them all back to self in so many ways. So many of the problems in, in the communities are because there's no dads in the home. Why aren't there dads there? Self. Men didn't, men abandoned their duty. Men wanted to have their pleasure but not their responsibility. And so self is, for the purpose of this message, I'm just gonna say today, self is the problem. It's the big problem. And guess what? Self is the big problem in your life and mine. Whatever issues we have here today in this room, whatever struggles you're having, whether it's a marriage struggle, whether it's a, a struggle with uh, some other relationship, whether it's a struggle in your own life with some kind of controlling thing that's a bondage, we can trace it back to self. Yes, Satan is real. Demonic influences are real and have to be dealt with at times. But there has to be a self there for the devil to work with if he's gonna do anything. And so, you would think that something this destructive as self would be universally condemned, right? You would think everybody would just hate it, would condemn it, would say, this is bad, we gotta do something about it. But that's not the case. In fact, self is universally praised and fed and uh, coddled and, and promoted. The opposite, we love ourself, we promote ourself, we exalt self-esteem, you know, about what was it, 40 years ago or so, the self-esteem movement really took root. The big problem on earth is that we don't have enough self-esteem. If we can just get everybody to have more self-esteem, so many things would just fall into line, they said. Did it work? Didn't work, did it? No, the fact of the matter is we, we love ourselves too much. 
We love ourselves. We promote self-confidence, self-fulfillment, self-preservation. Our favorite pictures to take are selfies. It's all about self. I want to say a word about social media because I think that one of, one of the big problems with social media is that it is a self feast where we promote ourselves. We think about ourselves. We put ourselves forward in the most flattering light possible. We, we build our brand about who we are and how we want people to perceive us. And you know, the, the studies they do, of the, the people who spend the most time on Facebook and, and social media and stuff seem to be the most miserable and depressed people. And there's different reasons people give for that. I would like to say this morning, I think a big reason is because it's a self-focus. I'm sitting there focused on myself and how I appear and how, my, how many friends I've got and how many people like me. And You know what? We weren't made to function that way. That is the, the, the upside down way for humans to function. It doesn't work. And I'd like to ask us today, you know, if, if you are into social media, what are you promoting there? I want to challenge us. What are we promoting there? Are we promoting ourself? Or are we promoting Jesus? And are we serving the Lord and others through that? You know, you can, you can do that. You can use those things to serve God and others, but you can also use it to promote self. And so I, I would ask, you know, what, what are we doing with those things? Self is a huge problem. This message um, is kind of a follow-up to Ross's message last week. You know how he brought out the gospel that Jesus has done it all for us? The two parts, he saved us from our sin, the penalty of our sin, the wages of our sin, but he also saved us from what? The power of our sin. The prescription for the, being saved from the penalty of sin is a much more pleasant one to take, right? I mean, that one goes down a lot easier. It's still, it's still hard, I guess, in, in a sense, but the prescription for the power of sin in our life is not a pleasant one. That's one of those ones that we gag at. That's one of those ones that actually, like I said here, it's a prescription nobody wants to take. And why is that? Because that prescription is death. God says self is so bad, my cure for it is not just a little this or a little that, it's death. And I put you on the cross with Jesus to take care of it. The question is, will we embrace that prescription? What did Jesus have to say about self? Let's look at Matthew 10, 29. We're just going to look at a few scriptures here. 10, 39, sorry. We'll go back just one more to 38. It says, and he that taketh does not take his cross and follow after me, is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. You know, he's talking about self right there. He that findeth his life, his self, is going to lose it. That word there for lose is a little, doesn't really bring out what the, the Greek terminology says. In Greek, it means to destroy it fully. He that would find his life, preserve his life, keep it, seek it, it says, he is going to destroy it fully. And he who destroys his life fully, he is going to find his life. That puts a little different light on it, doesn't it? He says, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. He says, love does not seek her own. And in 2 Corinthians, he died for all, that those who live should not from now on live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 
Paul said, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And Jesus said there in Luke 9, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So I'd like to bring out here today, if, if you're sitting here today and there's, there's bondages in your life, maybe you have baggage from the past, maybe you have relationship problems, you can be pretty sure that there's some uncrucified self at the root somewhere. And I think a lot of times as Christians, we don't, we don't want God's prescription because it's unpalatable. We don't want to die. And so we try other methods to deal with self. See, our sins were dealt with on the cross as far as we are forgiven. The blood has paid the price. But self is now the thing. We have to live, walk through this life. And God did put our self on the cross with Jesus, uh, crucified there with him. But we have to enter into that by faith. And that means it's going to be death to, that's going to come into our life in a hundred different ways, a thousand different ways. We try, sometimes we try to train self. You know, we think that maybe through Sunday school or through good training, we, we can uh, get rid of self or overcome self. It doesn't work. Sometimes we want to conquer self. We try to conquer it through what? Self-will, self-effort. You think that's going to work? You can't beat self yourself right. with self. But that's what we do because we're, we're so ingrained in us as humans that that's all we can think of is I got to do it. I can do it. I'm going to try harder. I, I think I can do it if I really get it this time. I failed last time, but I, I think if I do it really hard, I can get it. And so we try again. We try to conquer self through self-effort. Another way we try to conquer it is we try to, we think that maybe we can grow out of it. We can grow beyond it. If I just grow as a Christian, I will, you know, then I will, this old self won't bother me so much doesn't work. Maybe another thing is, is revivalism. We think that the way to overcome self is through uh, revival, where we have, and I'm not speaking against revival, but where we have revival preaching, where we repent of our sin, we get right with God, you know, and then we, we go forth in fresh and newness of life, which is important. But that doesn't necessarily take care of self. That's just taking care of the results of self. When Monday morning comes after the revival, guess what? We got to deal with self somehow. Another thing that's often uh, used in more of a charismatic realm is uh, seeking for an experience. Some ultimate experience that's going to finally rid me of, of the self that torments me. Uh, whether it's uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit or it's a, a revelation of God or a, a deliverance from a demon. Those are not necessarily, the, those are not the means that God chose to get rid of self. There's only one provided means of getting rid of self for you and me. What is it? It's there. It's the cross. That's it. You're not gonna get rid of it through any of those other means. And a lot of times, I guess the burden of the message is, you know, sometimes we have bondages and things for years in our life. And we're trying all these other methods to deal with it, but the underlying root has never been dealt with. It's self. There's only one thing that's good enough, strong enough, and able enough to deal with self. And that's the cross. We don't like it. We say, nope, I don't think I need that much help. You know, I'm not that bad. I think I can do it pretty good. If, you know, just give me time. I'm, I'm not that bad. And so we, we act like this guy here. And we don't want to take that prescription God gave that we can be cured. There's only one way, and God has provided it. 
it says in the Bible that Jesus has given us how many things that pertain to life and godliness? All things. We've heard that a lot these months. I think it's good to emphasize it. It's all provided. I'm not talking to you here today about something that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to make this muster it up. No, the provision is completely given in Jesus Christ. But we have to receive it by faith. Just like when to get saved, you had to enter into that by faith. You had to receive that gift of eternal life. You had to receive that Jesus died on the cross for me. He paid the price for me, and, and he offers to me salvation. You had to receive it by faith. We also have to receive the prescription for getting rid of self by faith. And that is that God knows best, and he said, there's nothing that's gonna enable you to get rid of self except death to self. I'd like to just go through, uh, and, and I'd like to bring something out here. You know, bondages, self, and self, life, they bring into our life a lot of pain. Bad relationships are painful. Bondages to sin are painful. They mess us up. They hurt. They feel bad. Do you know that's the mercy of God? He's letting you know you're sick. Just like our bodies, you know. We're designed in a way that when we're sick, we know something's wrong. If we get cut, we know something happened. So in our spirit, God has designed us that there's a pain mechanism that, that kicks in when there's something wrong and out of whack. It's his mercy. And so he allows us to experience that pain maybe for years, year after year. Why? So that we'll come to the point where we're tired of this and we're ready for this. Where we'll say, God, I'm finished. I am no good. Myself is not gonna be gotten better by better training and by trying harder. No, it's utterly hopeless. There's only one thing, and you know, the, the cross all of a sudden starts to look pretty attractive. When you're sick and tired of the bondage, you're sick and tired of all the pain that comes into your life, and you look up and you see this cross, and it's like, okay, so I mean, I can, I can there's a way out for me. I can actually be free. If you're sick enough, you're willing to take the remedy that hurts bad. You know, when I was a little kid, if I, if I was feeling sick, I might have been willing to drink that stuff. I, I felt fine. And so that's, that stuff was just terrible, and I wasn't going to drink it. But if I had felt terrible, if, I, if my stomach was all whatever agitated and I, I was feeling sick, you know what, I might have just somehow been able to gag it down because I would have thought, hey, look, it's, it's gonna, it tastes terrible and whatever, but I think it might help me. And unfortunately, we have to do the same thing in our life. We have to oftentimes get to that point where we feel that sickness to where we're ready to say, God, I'll, take, I'll drink it. I'll drink that cup, Lord. I'll take it. So I thought about this, and I thought about the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I just thought, you know, I'm just going to go through the Sermon on the Mount quickly yesterday as I was preparing for this. And I just want to see, well, what does Jesus have to say? What does it have to do with self? And to my, uh, I shouldn't say surprise because that's what I thought it would do. But basically, as I, I read through there, what I saw was the whole thing is about the death to self. The entire sermon from start to finish. That's what Jesus taught. He was teaching us how to what it means to die to self. Because a lot of times we ask, okay, die to self. Well, how do I do that? What does that look like? Well, let's look at the Sermon on the Mount. Let's just start there in Matthew 5. We could look at the Beatitudes there in the beginning. I'm not going to do that. Uh, but basically, they are attitudes that are contrary, really, to self and to what our natural way is, all of them. 
But I want to start in here. Uh, well, let's look at where in verse 13. It says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill. And he said, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And I want us to think here. I said earlier that the, the great problem in the world, the problem in America is self. It's a whole bunch of people who are living in self without God. And, and now we have all these societal problems. We have all these issues. We have riots. We have, you know, uh, major problems that are b bigger than anybody can solve except God. And what does God want to do in our, in our nation, in our neighborhood, in Lancaster? Doesn't he want to shine a light? Yes? Who's the light? He is, but who's the light that he's going to shine through? We are. He said, you're the light of the world. And so what God is looking for, what he needs in America and throughout the world is people who have, are finished with self, who are not walking in self. The thing that, the, the great problem in American Christianity as I look at it over these years that I've been a Christian now for 30 plus years is so much of it is just self, packaged in a religious package. And our neighbors and the world looks on and they go, hey, they're, they're really no different than I am. They're just into religion. They don't actually see a difference. They don't actually see somebody who's dead to self. When they see someone who's dead to self, that's going to take note right there. When you're on your job working and, and you get, somebody does something really offensive and you don't hit back and you bless them instead, whoa, they just saw a light. They just saw something that you don't see any other way except for God's people. It's not anywhere to be found except in the people of God. So let's take a look. He said, you're the light of the world, the salt of the earth, and it's the start of his sermon. Now he's going to show you what it means to be salty and what it means to be light. He says, he starts out there and says, if you've, you've heard that you shall not kill, and whosoever will kill will be in danger of the judgment. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief because we know that we're not killers. But he said, I say to you, Whoever's angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of the judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Rekha shall be in danger of the council, but whoever will say, Thou fool, will be in danger of hell fire. In other words, the works of the flesh, one of the works of the flesh is murder, killing. God says it has to go deeper than that. We're cutting it out at the root. You're not even allowed to be angry with people. You're not allowed to treat people bad. And therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and remember, your brother has anything against you, leave your gift at the altar. That's a death to self right there, isn't it? I mean, I was so glad. I came to church. I had this gift. I'm going to bring it to the Lord. This is wonderful. I feel good about myself. And I get there, and God says, remember what you said to so-and-so this week? That was wrong. You hurt them. I want you to leave your gift right here and go make it right. Oh. Death to self. And he says, and then he goes on, he talks about adultery. You heard that you should not commit adultery, but I say to you, as you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery already. See, self goes into the inner workings. It's not just that I'm good and I, don't, I would never commit adultery with another uh, a lady. No, God says, we've got to get to the root of that, which is self, that you're not going to indulge yourself in those thoughts that are, that are feeding your flesh and your pride. That's what leads people to adultery, isn't it? And he says, you got to get radical. Remember I read about um, Jesus saying, you have, to, you, you have to destroy your life fully. 
He says here, you gotta cut your hand off and you gotta pluck your eye out. In other words, you gotta be radical with that self. You gotta take up that right there. That's the only way you're gonna get rid of that lust. That's the only way you're gonna get rid of that adulterous uh, attitude that wants to be in your life. You're not gonna train it out. You're not gonna grow it out. You're gonna have to take up your cross and say, no, I die to that thing. Jesus, live your life through me. That's it, that's the only thing that's gonna work. He goes on to say about divorce, you know. In the world, the world says, hey, if, if it's not working out, try it again, you know, get rid of this spouse and try another one. God says, no, you die to that self. You stay there, you be faithful. You live, you live for me. We could go on, you know, he talks about uh, if someone hits you on your cheek, turn to him the other cheek. That's death to self. That's the cross right there, isn't it? That's what the whole sermon's about. The whole thing. Jesus said, I want you to live your life with a cross. Where instead of doing the natural thing, the thing that comes by Adam, you're going to do the thing that comes from me. And that's why he said you've got to take it up how many times? Daily. You gotta take it up daily. We could go on, but I just wanna go briefly through these things, but you know, if someone compels you to go a mile, go two. That's a death to pride in self. What we wanna do is we'll, we'll go with him. If he says go with us a mile, we'll go nine-tenths of a mile. He's not gonna tell me what to do. The Christian says, hey, I'll go another one with you now. That's death to self. If your enemies curse you, do good to them. If they despitefully use you and persecute you, pray for them, love them, bless them. We can't do that without one of those on our shoulder. It won't work. Then he gets into religious, uh, religious stuff here. Prayer, giving, Fasting, you know, self can be pretty comfortable around those things, can it? Self, you know, there's a lot of selfish people who'll give millions of dollars. Just put my name on the side of the building. The Paul Lloyd Auditorium. I'll give you $10 million for that. And self is just happy as can be. Jesus said, no, that's not gonna work. You give the 10 million, but there's no name on the building. In fact, don't even let them know you, you gave it. Well, self can't get anything out of that. When you're fasting, you know what, if I walk around miserable and everybody looks at me and it's like, man, this guy is really something, he must be fasting. Self can love it. Self can just be right in the middle of that this is great. I love to fast. Or, or do I love to have people think I'm spiritual or something? No, Jesus said, you can't do any of that. When you fast, you gotta, you gotta make it like you're, you're, you know, just wash your face, like there's nothing going on. When you pray, you gotta do it so nobody hears you. When you give, you gotta do it in secret. Your right hand can't even know what your left hand's doing, or your left or right or whatever that is. Uh, Death to self. That's what Jesus taught throughout this whole sermon. And then at the end there, when he talks about prayer, he says you gotta forgive. You know, forgiving is a death to self. Because the natural man, when he's wronged, he's not gonna forgive. That's not right, they messed me up. They took something from me, they did me wrong. And they're gonna pay for it. But Jesus says, no, take up the cross. Lord, I forgive them. I release them from that. I'm not gonna hold that against them, God. I completely release whatever they did to me. But so many Christians struggle with, with that, the bondage of unforgiveness. So many Christians, why? We don't like the remedy. We embrace self. 
Then he goes on, he talks about money. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. In other words, use your money for stuff that's not about you. Death to self. And take no thought for your life. Don't worry about everything. You know, worry can be just self running rampant. I mean, isn't that what worry is? It's self. Self on the throne. I've got to be in control. I've got to worry this thing through. You know, I've got to work it out in my mind. Jesus said, take no thought. Don't worry about it. Worry is self. You know, if you're a worrier here today, if, if you struggle with worry, I want to give you, I want to, I want to um, offer you the remedy to worry. You can die to that thing. You can die to worry. You can lay it at the feet of the cross of Jesus and you can be finished with it. In verse chapter 7, he says, Judge not that you be not judged. Judging is another thing of self, isn't it? Oh, it feels so good to see those faults in those other people. It feels so good to just, you know, if they would, if they would do this, then they'd be good like I am. No, Jesus said, you don't judge. Don't, don't let yourself have that pleasure of judging other people. And we, we can go keep going here. He said, enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. The, the straight gate, the narrow way, is the way of the cross. The broad way is the way of self. And that's, you know, there's many ways because self, we're all different selves. And, and whatever your self likes, do it, says, says the devil and the world. And so it's a broad way. You can, you can be selfish any way you want. Go ahead. Enjoy life. Jesus said, don't go there at that gate. You go to the narrow gate. That's where self has to die. That's where you take up the cross and follow me. And he says, beware of false prophets. You know what a lot of the false prophets do? One way you can tell a false prophet is that they promote self. They, they promote it. They uh, make it feel good. You know, you can have your best life now. You can be, be wealthy. You can have it all. And there's no mention of the cross. That's false prophet material right there. He says, beware of false prophets. They come to you like, like a sheep, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. You'll know them by their fruit. If they're not teaching what I'm teaching, they're false prophets. If they're teaching you to just do what you want, you know, you can be a Christian and, and serve self, get away from them. They're false. The tree is known by his fruit. And he says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And he said that there'd be many people who come and say, Lord, I did this great stuff for you. I preached. I healed people. I prophesied, and Jesus said, I never knew you. And what I see there is, you know what? Those people are doing that stuff in self. They were just being self. In fact, it says, you workers of iniquity. That's workers of lawlessness, just self, doing your thing. So then he concludes and says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rains came and the winds blew and everything, it, was, it stood. It did not fall because it was founded on, on a rock. And I'm going to say here today, the rock is not I, but Christ. I think that's another way to say it. That's, 
legitimate. The rock is not I but Christ. The sand is self. And so how many hear the sayings of Jesus that all these sayings are, you know, completely, they're all about denying self. They're all about dying to yourself. They're all about giving up yourself. And yet when it comes down to the nitty gritty of life, when we're, you know, let's just bring it right down to our home. You know, when it comes down to my getting along with my wife, am I going to take it the cross? Am I going to ex exert myself? What is your life going to be about this week? And my life? Tomorrow morning, what is our life going to be about? Is it going to be all about me? You? Or is it going to be not I but Christ? I have a burden that we would somehow, that God would somehow open our eyes to see that the beauty of the cross, the, uh, the, the remedy of the cross, I'm concerned that, that um, for myself, for all of us, that too many times we, we want to deal with self in some other way because the cross is just offensive. It's offensive to, to us. And I mean the cross that we want to, the cross of, of taking up our cross daily. I mean, we love the cross of Jesus, right? We'll sing the songs about it, the old rugged cross, the... all those nice hymns, but when it comes to my life, my relationships, my work, do I embrace that? And I'm gonna to say to us today, if we don't embrace it, then God will let us continue to experience the results of a life that's lived like that. And that's pain, that's um, stuff that's not working. His remedy is the cross. It's a prescription that nobody wants to take except the people who are so sick and tired that they go, Lord, thank you that there's something. There's a way out. And for me, you know, it's, uh, it's, I I've have to come to such a place where I tried so many times to, to overcome this self and failed that it, it, it starts to look attractive. Death starts to look attractive. It starts to look like a wonderful thing. I wish I could have said it better here today. I hope maybe somebody got it. Let's pray. Lord, we truly do need revelation from heaven to see our condition, to see that we're what we're made of, to realize that we do not have what it takes. Even after we're saved, We're just a vessel that needs a savior to be on the throne and to be guiding and leading. Lord, I, I tried. I pray that somehow you would open our understanding in each of our lives, that the cross, our daily cross, would not be something that we leave on the shelf because it doesn't taste good, and because it makes us gag. Lord, I pray that your people would take the prescription, all of us. We would embrace the cross. 
we would welcome it to do the work in our life so that we can have the not I and the but Christ. We can't have the not, we can't have the but Christ without the not I. So Lord, so work in us that we would be the city on the hill, the light of the world. And Father, that the, our neighbors, our friends, here in our county, our community in the United States would see, not just us, but all your people, your church, would see something different, would see a people that are dead, a people that are finished with themselves, a people who recognize that it's not about me. Bless each one with that grace, I pray, in Jesus' name.